right, good morning. But uh, nobody was everybody excited, bright and bright eyed, bushy tailed, ready to learn about yeah, optic yeah. nerves? Like All right, so today we're going back to the Grand Tetons. And so, for those of you, I don't know, I see nice suits here. Yeah. Who are you guys? Hi, uh, Nathan and <laughs> For the path? Huh? Welcome. Where <laughs> <laughs> people wear a suit in this morning I thought about it. You're a I thought we were gonna up you I thought we were gonna upgrade it and shame these guys to you know show up with at least a tie on or something. <laughs> Alright, so what we do is is I've got a captive audience here so I get to show people my travel slides. So this is always this is always um, fun for me and not for you guys. But and so this is the brain trust for the ASCRS Cataract Clinical Committee meeting. And so we had a meeting in Jackson. And so we showed up the first morning. Now, this is not planned, but you can see how great minds think alike. So <laughs> this is the uniform for the, you know, the Cataract Clinical Committee from ASCRS. And so we said we got to take a picture of this because we all showed up wearing the same thing. So what was fun was that as part of this retreat, you know, we get to do some fun stuff in the afternoon. And so there's a... a it's called the Teton Raptor Center. And basically these guys have domesticated um, raptors and so they bring them around so you can look at them. So this is a peregrine falcon, which you know is, is pretty good, you know, pretty good predator. But then they brought a golden eagle. And so if you look at these guys, you know, their wings are tucked in, but they've got about a five-foot wingspan and some serious claws. And I mean these are some serious, serious raptors. And so the fun thing is, is they've got them there, and, and the, the people from the center, of course, you, you give them a donation, of course, but they, uh, they will come and they'll talk about what they do and how they rescue these birds and, and try to eventually rehabilitate them and train them and go back to the wild. And so if you look at them, these are some pretty, um, yeah, that's a pretty majestic looking bird right there. And so they're all over around the Grand Tetons. You'll see falcons, you'll see eagles, both bald and um, golden. So I thought I'd just show you guys some of these guys. It's very rare you get to sit a foot away from a, from a golden eagle. All right, so today we're going to talk about optic nerve. So this is what, what the optic nerve looks like as we're looking in. And you can see the nice, sharp edge, non-elevated, non-congested, um, reasonable color as you're looking in, vessels, arteries coming out, venules going in. Okay, let's start with Ashley. Ashley, what uh, what stain are we using here? A trichrome. And how can you say it's a trichrome? Um, just because I just because the, the I don't think my way is the best way, but just because of the colors. Well, exactly. So, <laughs> so what do you remember now? Now the third color for trichrome never shows up in any of these in any of these pictures, but in any event, it stains connective tissue blue and it stains parenchymal tissue red or pink. And so if you look, here's the optic nerve itself, and then it's got the connective tissue around it that is staying this blue color, okay? So my analogy to the optic nerve is that, think of the optic nerve as a fiber optic cable. And so each axon, as it leaves that ganglion cell, goes through the lamina cribrosa and then out into the optic nerve, and once it gets posterior, to the lamina cribrosa, it becomes myelinated. So it's a single fiber optic cable, and it's got a little plastic around it. It's got myelin around it. Then these columns of axons, they form bundles with these little piocepti in between them. So those are the fiber optic bundles that you see when the fiber optic cable's there. Then the whole thing is shoved into the ground, but you can't put those fiber optic cables in the ground, so you have to put a steel cable around it, a steel round tube around it, and that's the optic nerve sheath. And so if you think of it as like a fiber optic cable in the ground, that's how you can remember it. So each axon gets myelinated, just posterior to the lamina cribrosa, and then these bundles of axons have these little PL septa in between them, and then the whole thing is surrounded by the optic nerve. Okay, so here we see in cross, well, I gotta get a better picture than that. That's like 30 years old now. <laughs> I'll take it. Remind me, guys, when we get a, a um, retinoblastoma, you know, with a good optic nerve, I'll take a better picture. But here's the optic nerve sheath. And so remember, this is the second cranial nerve. And so it's got similar surroundings to what the brain has. And so you've got the 
dural sheath around it, the optic nerve sheath, and then you've got the arachnoid granulation, subarachnoid space, and then the pia mater forming these little individual columns. Okay, Becca, what are these two structures? Central retinal artery and vein. Exactly. So if you remember from last week, central retinal artery and vein, they share this common adventitial sheath, and so thickening of that artery, arteriosclerosis, actually pushes on the vein next to it and can, can cause vein occlusion. And here's a close-up. This is the optic nerve sheath. These are these arachnoid granulations, subarachnoid space. And then lastly, here are the individual axons with these little peel septa in between them. And here you can see a longitudinal. Okay, now there are some cells that live in between these columns here. Did you see the little blue cell bodies? So Jason, what are the, some of the cells that live in there? Okay, with endothelial cells, but they're mostly on the outside. They're more in that subarachnoid arachnoid space, so they don't usually live inside the parenchyma itself. What are the cells that produce the myelin? Oligodendrocytes. So that myelin's got to come from somewhere. So some of these blue nuclei are oligodendrocytes, but there are also astrocytes that live in them, and that's important because you look at what tumors can affect the nerve. You don't get tumors of the nerve itself. You get tumors of the cells that are in the nerve. And so you get oligodendrocytes, you get astrocytes that live in there. And here we can see again, central retinal artery, central retinal vein. And here they're apart, and then as you get closer and closer to the optic nerve head, they eventually come together. All right, so Chris, what are we seeing here? Uh, fundus photo of the right eye with some kind of myopic changes around the optic nerve, tilted disc. Um, okay, a little closer. So at first glance, you may say that's a myopic change, but I would say it's a little bit different than that. Mm -hmm. You've definitely got this crescent of white around it. Right. I mean, it looks like, a, from the photo, it looks like a tilted disc, but I know that you're trying to lead me to well, here's, here's the outline of the disc itself. Right. So that's actually a very small disc. Yeah, so a hypoplastic. Exactly. This is a hypoplastic disc. And so the way you tell this apart, myopic discs are big. Right. You still have that temporal crescent, but myopic discs are large. They're not small. They're larger discs. Whereas if you look right here, you can see this is a small disc. So this is a hypoplastic disc, kind of the opposite. Right. So what do you worry about in these patients? Uh, so cranial nerve, I mean not cranial nerve, central nerve, uh, or central nervous system abnormalities, uh, mainly central or midline abnormalities okay. like the septum pollution. And if this is inherited, how is it inherited? Usually autosomal dominant. Exactly. So it's usually autosomal dominant. So it's interesting, I saw a teenager was referred to him by an outside optometrist for funny looking discs. And we looked at it and they had a plastic disc, and so we asked the mom, do you mind if I take a look at you? And sure enough, mom had one too. Oftentimes, though, if these are just isolated to the eye, they do not cause problems. And so they're really not, and, and really these aren't more at risk for like um, ischemic optic neuropathy, as far as I know. And so oftentimes these are just benign looking discs, but this is a hypoplastic optic disc. Okay, Tara, what are we seeing here? Exactly. And what does coloboma mean? Um, I think I would be guessing. Anybody? A, a failure of fusion of the embryonic fissure, like but pepperonis. It is, but it... Well, there's a Greek... Once somebody look it up. <laughs> <laughs> of course, what language does it come from? Okay, maybe keyhole or something? From the Greek, so look it up. Coloboma. <laughs> look it up. <laughs> look it up. So, but exactly, this is indeed an optic nerve coloboma. So Eileen was on to something. Look at the location where it is. So it's usually these colobomas are inferior. So Tara, why would an optic nerve coloboma be inferior? Um, because of the formation embryologically, that it, that's where it kind of failed to form. Okay, so how does that happen? What happens embryologically that, that 
allows these colobomas to form here inferiorly at the optic nerve? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, so remember when that optic vesicle, it, it pushes out from the primitive neuroectoderm and then it invaginates. Well, on the inferior part, those vessels, those hyaloid vessels come in and feed that as it's growing. But when it starts to seal off, that globe will seal at the equator and then it'll like, be like a zipper that you're going both directions. So start from the equator and go back to the optic nerve and anterior to the iris. So when you get a defect in the closure of that fissure, that's when you get a coloboma. And so optic nerve is the posterior part of that fissure, so you get an optic nerve coloboma. The anterior component of that would be what? Even and more anterior than that. Uh, the iris? Exactly. So those iris colobomas are the same thing. They're inferiorly there, and they're kind of the anterior most location of that embryologic fissure that's not fusing. Now, this is the ultimate kind of coloboma, I call it. Eileen, what is this one called? Uh, retinochoroidal coloboma. This is named, this has got a specific name to it. So it's like a giant optic nerve coloboma. This is named after the flower, the morning glory. And so if you think of a morning glory flower, it's like a trumpet horn. Okay, did we find coloboma? Oh, yeah, it means defect. But I had a question. Yes, sir. So the difference between like optic nerve pit and coloboma like pathologically? We're, we're getting to that. Oh, we are. But yes, hold that question. But it's highly debated. Um, some people think that they're related and some people think that they aren't. Exactly, and they're still debating on exactly what leaks out from a coloboma too, so, so that's, we're, we're coming to that. So this is a morning glory flower, and if you think of it, it looks like a trumpet horn. And so when you go back to that optic nerve morning glory syndrome, it's like the ultimate coloboma. It's like you don't get any of the posterior part forming properly, but not only that, but it's almost like there's this trumpet horn going away from you. So when you look in there, you see that this is in focus here, but this is all blurry because that's actually moving away from you. So this is called the morning glory syndrome. You can see that there's very little um, you know, active fibers going in there, so you can get a significant visual loss from these morning glory anomalies. All right, speaking of which, we're going to skip to Reese. So Reese, what are we looking at right here? Yeah, looks more like <laughs> Optic nerve pit, exactly. There it is. And so, I'd like to show you guys the obvious. I probably shouldn't do that because that's so obvious. Even these guys interviewing me. Well, maybe they wouldn't know, but you never know. So, but this is an optic nerve pit, and so it's pretty obvious here. You know, maybe one of the interns could pick it up. So I don't know. Maybe Becca would figure that out. But this is an optic nerve pit, and what's the biggest problem with an optic nerve pit in terms of vision? Just attachments. And how do they occur? Um, I mean, they hit. So you did like that. All right, so indeed, here is an optic nerve pit. Here's the optic nerve head, and you see part of the retina almost dipping into that, but the reason that people lose vision is you actually get fluid leaking under the retina. And so some people would argue, they'll say it's CSF fluid leaking. Other people say, no, it's something different, and they talk about how you're on a gasset, and there's a big argument about exactly what happens. But the bottom line is when you get an optic nerve pit, you can get leakage of fluid from the optic nerve under the retina to the macula. So if you think about that, how do you usually get rid of that? Well, you could laser it, but you know, if you laser that bundle, that bundle coming from the macula, the optic nerve, you're going to kill it. And so it's going to be, you guys are way too young, but in your history books, which they don't teach you anymore, there was this war called Vietnam. And in Vietnam, these generals would get up there and they would say, well, we bombed the village to save it. So you get these Viet Cong would infiltrate into the village. So what would the U.S. do? They bomb the hell out of it. So they destroy the whole village. But we got rid of the Viet Cong. And so it's the same thing here. And so if you were to laser that, yeah, you'd get rid of the fluid, but you'd kill the retina. And so these are tough to treat. Some people have done vitrectomies and tried to put gas in there and push it back. And others have tried to do some light laser in that area. But these are tough to seal off because the fluid leaks out and goes underneath the, underneath the macula. All right, now we're going to go back. Lee, what are we seeing here? And that's not, you know, a picture that, that Joa took. I mean, this is actually in focus. <laughs> um, it looks like a myelinated uh, retina. 
Exactly. So you can see that that, that white in there almost looks like kind of a giant cotton wool spot. That's actually myelination. And so remember, those axons normally don't become myelinated until they cross through the lamina cribrosa. And so sometimes you can get myelination that jumps the lamina cribrosa and hits the retina. And usually these are congenital. And so the optic nerve is interesting. When the nerve grows, the nerve fibers themselves grow from that optic cup back to the chiasm, but the myelination goes opposite. So the myelination later in embryology comes from the chiasm forward, and then it stops at the lamina cribrosa, but sometimes it jumps and you'll get these. Now, do these cause visual problems? They can, um, but Yeah, so you can kind of get an enlargement of the blind spot or maybe a little focal defect because they will, the fibers are still working okay, but that myelination will block some of the transmission underneath them, much like a giant cotton wool spot would. Does people have increased risk at all of like a, like a pasture build or something that's, that would come from that? Uh, Usually not. Usually it's a separate, it's a separate entity. So I'm not sure why you know, when just once they jump and start growing, they don't have a chance of growing even more, but they don't. So these people aren't at increased risk for that. Well, so I'm supposed to say, sorry, to, to make you guys have more esteem. Good question. Very good, very good. Sorry, I'm not slipping here. I'll have to. I didn't bring trophies for everybody today. But good question. Actually, that's what you say when you don't know the answer to it, and you're intending to go, that's a good question. And then if you don't know, then you say, why don't you look that up and get back to us? And that way you go, what's the answer? No, but as far as I know, that's not related to like, you know, astrocytomas or glutamine or anything like that. All right, Nico, what are we seeing here? So this is a photo of the optic nerve. So the, the borders are a little hazy all throughout. And then there's like, uh, in the center, there's like these yellow Exactly. So you see this bumpiness here. And so at first glance, and again, you'll, you may get these referred in. I've, get, I've gotten these referred in from outside ERs before where they said, oh my God, this patient has papilla edema. Because when you first look in there, it looks like the optic nerve is swollen. But if you look carefully, you'll see there's these little deposits here. And these are drusen. Now the tricky ones are when the drusen are buried. So if they're down deep where you can't quite see them, that optic nerve head looks elevated. And can you have bilateral drusen? Yeah, and so people look in and they say, oh my God, it's papilledema. And this can actually be buried drusen. Now, sometimes, you know, if you look at them, they're, they're pretty blatant here. This is a bilateral drusen, but you can see them pretty well here and even here um, on these different, on these bilateral views. And so you see the drusen. What are optic nerve drusen comprised of? Uh, there's usually calcium. Okay. Okay, so there you can see that's a severe one. That's even one with atrophy there. And that's just kind of showing you these buried views and how they're harder to see. So there's calcium in them. And so what does that mean if you were to do a CT scan? Uh, it'll light up. Yeah. And so look at the drusen right here. And so if you were to do a CT scan, they light up. But what's an easier thing you can do in the clinic besides send them to a CT scan? Exactly. So if you think about how ultrasound works, when sound waves hit something thick, thickly calcified, they really bounce off hard. And so if you put a B scan on these and you find the shadow of the optic nerve, you'll see a bright spike right in that area. And even if you turn the gain down, the eye starts to disappear and then there still be that area of the calcification there. So you can diagnose these with a B scan. They, they are even early on, and, and so the ultrasound is a good way if you've got some deep drusen. You look in there and you say, nah, I think there might be drusen. I don't think this is papilledema. You can just grab a B scan, put it on there. You'll be able to tell if there's any calcium there, because if it's truly papilledema, there'll be no calcium or no lesions there at all. So very important to tell. And so you can actually even do it with a CT scan, because that's a better one. You can see by that over here. Bilateral Jerusalem. How come one of the globes was white? Yeah, that was weird. Good question. I have to show that to Chris <laughs> Davidson. That's funny. I never thought of it. It's like this one's white and that one's not. And it's the same. It should be the same scan, so I'm not sure. Maybe it's silicone in there. Yeah. 
because it fills that completely. You know, it's funny, all this time I'm looking at Drusen and I never even noticed that. <laughs> Good pickup. Good pickup. <laughs> Believe it or not, no, these are older people, and have you ever seen old people where they've got that calcified um, place where the muscle inserts anteriorly? Right there. So you see, that's where the muscle insert anteriorly. So this is an older person. Yeah. So here you see, this is the optic nerve head, gross photograph, and you see it's in front of the lamina curvosa, but underneath the optic nerve head itself. And so that's the and you can see right here again, optic nerve head, lamina curvosa, and you see those calcified drusen underneath the fibers coming in. Now, could these cause visual problems? Drusen. Um, you can have like an enlarged blind spot, I think. That you can, but even more than that, they'll often get nerve fiber layer defects. Sometimes when these nerve fiber layer bundles are coming over the drusen, you can actually get the big ones with disruption. And so Brad Katz at one time was doing um, serial visual fields on these patients through the years, and I think he did show that as the drusen get bigger and bigger, you can get these little focal nerve fiber layer visual defects. And you can see right here, here's some drusen here, and drusen here, and this nerve is being a little bit more atrophic. A little bit more atrophic. These are further along. All right, what are we seeing right here, Chris? So this looks like optic nerve and edema. Okay, and I'm glad you said it that way because they love on all boards to ask you about this, and so you'll say, edema," and then the examiner goes, hmm, like this, because by definition, what is papilledema? Bilateral optic nerve swelling from Exactly, for pressure increase. And so you never say papilledema looking at one nerve when you're on oral boards. You say, this is a swollen optic nerve. And then they say, what's the differential diagnosis? And then you can say, well, if it's bilateral and the pressure is high, it can be papilledema. If it's due to congestion, you know, or something in the nerve itself. But if you look, you can see that the edges of that nerve are irregular. You've got some flame hemorrhages here. You've got some dilation of the venules. And so this is classic optic nerve swelling, and if it's bilateral being <coughs> high pressure, we call it papilledema. There's a severe one. Again, this would be one, you know, even a, a, a student would recognize them. You know, one of the applicants would recognize. So, definite papilledema here. Lots of flame hemorrhages, elevated disc, engorgement of the vessels. And so this is what it looks like. And so remember from a few weeks ago, we showed you the glaucomatous changes where you get that excavation and that cupping. This is the opposite. And so when you look at this, you actually get swelling here of the nerve. So it pooches out from the nerve. You have engorgement of the vessels, but you've also got hemorrhages on the anterior surface. And boy, this is dying in here rapidly. I'm getting a new battery here. But so you can see hemorrhages on the surface there. And so this is optic nerve swelling or papilledema. If we're by that on. This is actually the lamina curbrosa gets bowed forward. So it's almost like that pressure pushes it forward. And so you get forward bowing of the lamina fibrosa in this optic nerve swelling. All right, what are we seeing right here, Joa? So this is the right eye. And it seems like this is complete blockage um, of like the optic head, not even like swelling. Well, if you look right here, this is interesting because this is more focal swelling. So if you look carefully, look at superiorly, it looks like that optic nerve is swollen superiorly, but inferiorly, you know, down here, it's not quite as swollen up here, it's more swollen. So what's your differential diagnosis here? Let's say this is unilateral. <laughs> but but no, when you're thinking of a segmental, you know, optic nerve swelling, you, know, you want to start looking at broad categories of the etiology. So what are a couple of broad categories that could cause this? Maybe CRM or CR. Let's take a step back even even more. How about ischemia? All right. So when you look at a focal nerve 
and there's some focal swelling in that nerve. You want to look at various areas. You could have ischemia. What's that? Okay, no. So, so you want to start to develop a differential diagnosis, and that's what's important. And when you see focal swelling like this, now, uh, Ashley, let's say this is a 20 year old. Um, potentially optic neuritis. Exactly. So, you worry about optic neuritis. Optic neuritis in the acute phase can give you some segmental swelling of the disc and some focal swelling. Now, oftentimes it's more posteriorly, so you often don't see anything in the disc. But if you do, you can get some focal swelling there. What's another etiology? Let's say this is a 70-year-old. AION. Exactly. So anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So you want to start thinking of what could happen. And, and so when you're looking at someone and they're young and you've got a little edema here in their eye, so they say, oh, my eye suddenly went blurry and it hurts when I move. You start thinking of things like optic neuritis. If you have a 70-year-old male, and he's a smoker, and he's overweight, and he's on high blood pressure medicine, and he comes in and he says, you know, I woke up this morning and half my vision is gone. Then again, that could be something like this. So this could be an ischemic optic neuropathy, AION, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. All right, uh, Becca, what is this we're showing? Why would I be showing you this? <coughs> it's like um, possibly a clot. Right, so what are we looking at first? <coughs> I'm guessing it's the central retinal artery. So it is, it's an artery. Except we usually don't, unless the person dies, we don't get pieces of central retinal artery. <laughs> what artery do we actually get? Oh, that's biopsy? probably the, superior, uh, the temporal artery. Exactly. This is a temporal artery biopsy seen in cross-section. Why would we be taking a biopsy of the temporal artery? If you were concerned for GCA. Exactly. And so when you see someone who's got ischemic optic neuropathy, one of the things you don't want to miss is you don't want to miss an arteritic form. Now, most run-of-the-mill AIONs are not inflammatory. They're not arteritic. They're, you know, you get arterial sclerosis and you get those little posterior ciliary arteries blocking off. But you don't want to miss a case of what's called giant cell arteritis or you, know, you don't want to miss a granulomatous inflammation of those arteries because that can cause people to lose vision in both eyes. And so you'll do a superficial temporal artery biopsy. Why? Because you can take that out without harming anything. So I mean, you're always going to find a case report somewhere where you know someone's circle of Willis is completely closed off and the superficial temporal artery is feeding it. I mean, that's like you know, one in several million. And so you can pretty much remove these safely without causing any harm. And then we can look at it and see if there's any inflammation. Now, do you see inflammation on this one? No. Yeah, and so we, we don't see any here. And so you look at a temporal artery and cross section, there's the lumen, and it's got some red blood cells in. Here's the intima. That actually looks pretty good. So this. I want this artery right now. This is a pretty good looking artery. So this guy's not been to Crown Burgers or Moochies, you know, eating those pastrami cheeseburgers and those cheese steaks, you know. And so pretty good looking into my and then this little squiggly line is the internal elastic lamina. And you see that's completely intact. So I like to say, what does that look like? You ever see those satellite pictures of the Mississippi River when it's like flooding Iowa every spring and you know wiggles back and forth? That's what this looks like. And then outer to that is the muscular media completely intact. And then the adventitia around that, no inflammatory cells. What are we seeing right here, Jason? So this looks quite inflamed. Looks like the lumen's quite closed off. All right, so we start in the middle. What do you make of the lumen? It's very narrow. Very narrow. So this patient has severe arterial sclerosis. So this is lots and lots of cheeseburgers, you know, and pastrami and all that other good stuff. So. Markedly thick and intima. Look at the internal elastic lamina. Totally, pretty much wide out, and you can't even see the muscular media here. And then the adventitia is surrounded by this cuff of blue. So this is a positive temporary biopsy, and you can see that, that when you get this, you're at real risk for the arteries completely closing off. And so you really have to treat these with steroids right away. So. If you see a patient and there's a high suspicion for temporal arteritis, start them on steroids now. Then you can set them up for the biopsy. But if you wait for the biopsy results, 
and, and to give them the steroids, they could actually lose vision not only in that eye, but in the other eye. So start them on steroids now, and then do the biopsy within seven to 10 days, and then you'll see if you need to keep them on there. My pet peeve is you get the guys you know, that are referring from the outside, they say, oh, we think this is temporal arthritis. So what do they do? They give them 40 of prednisone. Now, is 40 enough to, to stop it? No. And do they do a biopsy? No. So then the patient gets aseptic necrosis of their hip or they get crazy from the prednisone. They say, well, do they still need to be on it? So then we do the biopsy. And then you see an artery that you say, well, is it healed arteritis? Because the inflammation's calmed down and you try to figure it out. So the key is if you're going to put somebody on steroids, maybe for a long time, you got to have a diagnosis. And so, so long as you do the biopsy within seven to 10 days, you can tell if that's the case. And so do the biopsy, but start the steroids first because you want to prevent that. And what are we looking at right here, Jason? So we see a lot of giant cell. Giant cell, that's the name, giant cell arteritis. And so you can see the um, giant cell that's there. And so you don't have to have giant cells necessarily. You can just have lymphocytes and maybe some epithelial cells, but it's called giant cell arteritis. And here we can see this is that iffy one. So this is someone who's been on steroids for a long time and they ran into complications. They want to know, is this giant cell arteritis? And if you look, there's a little bit of thickening of the intima. There's a little bit of disruption of the um, internal elastic lamin. And over here, look, the muscular media is gone from that area. So this is be what we call a healed arteritis. So this is one that's been on steroids for a while. And you do it, but we don't want to make the diagnosis here. We want to make it on the front end because you need to know what you're treating if you're going to put somebody on steroids. All right, so we're looking here. Chris, what are we seeing here? Uh, so it's a fairly, so there's a little bit of edema there, super nasally, and then it's a fairly kind of white disc. Yeah, disc so this like, is, what could this be? Giant cell arteritis. Yeah, it could be, or it could even be AION. Right. It could be in, and maybe this is not quite acute because you see a little bit of pallor right there and a little bit of swelling there. And this is what happens when you get an AION, be it arteritic or not. This is the optic nerve <laughs> pattern. If you look right here, it's just wiped out. I mean, you look at that, here's some normal nerve down here, but you look in this area and it's just wiped out. And so what happens is it's, it's those little posterior ciliary arteries which feed much of the optic nerve head that block off with either AION or arteritic AION. And then you can get the optic nerve pretty much wiped out. All right, boy, again, I keep showing you guys these swollen discs. You know, here's another one, Tara. Anything different about this one? Um, I mean, it kind of looks like more like, you know, 360 diffusely elevated. Uh... So again, if it's unilateral instead of bilateral, so it's not, <coughs> you know, uh, increased intracranial pressure. So what's your differential? If it's unilateral, uh -huh. like AION. Exactly. So it could be ischemic, AION. Could be optic, um, optic nerve, in, could be inflammatory, again. So it could be an optic neuritis. Could be increased pressure from a tumor blocking it off or something. So you always want to keep that in the back of your mind when you're looking at these. And we look at this one, and let's say that person was 20, and they have this piece of the nerve right here. Exactly, segmental demyelination. So here's that normal nerve myelinated, and here's some segmental demyelination. So what would cause that? Multiple sclerosis. Exactly, optic neuritis, and the most common thing, of course, is multiple sclerosis. So you guys got to be aware, I'm sure that the neurologist really pounded in your head about the trials that were done, and how you use your steroids, and how you do IV, and then go to oral. And it's very interesting, that study, because people used to give patients kind of a moderate dose of oral steroids, and it turned out that actually makes things worse. And so when you see people coming in with this acute neuritis, you've got to blast them with a high dose of IV steroids and then taper the oral steroids. And not only does it make the neuritis heal quicker, but it actually, it may not prevent MS, but it certainly will delay MS for up to a couple of years afterwards. So kind of important that you treat them right away with the high dose steroids. But if you don't, you could get this segmental demyelination. So this is optic neuritis. 
this patient did have MS. And here you can see kind of a longitudinal view, again, this area right over here, a segmental area of demyelination of the optic nerve seen sagittal. Now, what happens in the long run uh, on any of these lesions, Eileen? Yeah, if you look right here, there's the optic nerve sheath. There's the pedal. Look how big that optic nerve space is. And it's not that there's fluid in there pushing it out. It's that the optic nerve has shrunk. And so anything that can damage it, ischemic, inflammatory, compressive, whatever, eventually those axons can start dying off, and then you get shrinkage. So this is an atrophic optic nerve. This is an end stage. How long does it take? when you've had, say, an acute ischemic episode of the nerve for that nerve to turn pale? Three months. Yeah, weeks at least, maybe even months. And so when you guys are looking in there saying, well, that nerve looks pretty good, that can't be ischemia. No, because it takes a, a while for those axons to really die off and for that nerve to turn white and pale. So it could be weeks, maybe even a couple of months after an event for the nerve to turn pale, and eventually it gets, it gets atrophic. All right, Lee. What are we seeing here? What else are you seeing when you look here? Again, because I know you don't have depth perception in a flat picture. Is. And, you know, that's the normal side. So when you see a bilateral picture, the first thing you got to do is say, geez, which eye is abnormal? So you're looking here, saying, which of those two is abnormal? But if you look right here, look at that sulcus, how it's full up there, and you almost get the idea that that eye is pushing out. Something's behind it pushing it out. How old is this patient? I would guess 13, 10. Yeah, so they're an adolescent. They're probably, I, think, I think she was like 10. And so you've got this unilateral kind of proptotic eye, there's a fullness somewhere behind it, it looks like it's sticking out. And then you look in and you see this. What do you see in here? So it looks like there's retinal folds. Exactly, or they people call these choroidal folds. So what are the causes of choroidal folds? Okay. And where would the mass be located usually? In anywhere in the orbit or a particular place in the orbit? place. <laughs> you did answer the question. I give you credit for that, yeah. Which particular place? Um, it could be superchoroidal. Um, it could be, um, um, it could also be. So what I'm getting at, you have to sometimes play, guess what the, the person's thinking, but a mass within the muscle cone behind the eye pushing forward can give you these choroidal falls. Now, you know, I was taught that, that you know, choroidal folds, that means there's like a tumor in there, so you should be really worried. It turns out that's really not true. When people looked at a bunch of patients with choroidal folds, it turns out the most common cause is actually just a hyperopic eye that's kind of flat on the posterior surface, which is interesting. So, you know, we used to get excited about these. We said, oh my God, you have to order a CT scan <coughs> right away. And it turns out, you know, a hyperopic eye that's kind of flat can give you choroidal folds too. So it doesn't necessarily mean a tumor, but if you do have a mass, it means a mass in the muscle cone. All right, so this is what happens if you, and this is a little overexposed, but this is what happens if a mass sits in that muscle cone long enough and causes problems. This is a totally atrophic optic nerve, so you get total atrophy there. All right, so we're looking at, at the um, scan here, and what are we seeing in the scan? So there's a mass right behind. Exactly. So what do you worry about if that was indeed a 10-year-old and that was this girl's scan? 
Okay, exactly. So you worry about an optic nerve glioma. And so what cells do the gliomas arise from? Uh, astrocytes. And so when you look at astrocytomas anywhere in the central nervous system, they're graded from grade one, the most benign, to grade four, the most malignant. What are the optic nerve gliomas usually? Uh huh. What astrocytoma grade? Uh, they're like grade one. Grade one, exactly. And so people used to call these juvenile pilocytic gliomas. That means hair like. And I'll show you the path why they came up with that. But the key thing is these are the benign part of astrocytomas. And so they're not malignant. They're benign. Now, granted, they're growing in the optic nerve. They can cause a lot of damage to the nerve. And if they go back into the chiasm, they cause damage to the other eye. But these don't metastasize or they don't spread. They're a low grade, a grade one astrocytoma. And here we can see one that's been removed. Here's the nerve, here's the sheath above it, and then you can see this big fusiform enlargement within the nerve itself. So these astrocytes are inside the nerve and they're growing right there. They're not growing around the nerve, they're actually growing intrinsic to the nerve. And here you can see an eye that's been removed and you see this glioma behind it. All right, so Nico, you can see this is why we call this pilocytic or hair-like. You know, pathologists spend a lot of time in a poorly ventilated basement room sniffing formalin, and so you can sometimes see things that maybe other people don't quite say, really? But in any event, you look at this, you can see where you've got these kind of thin spindly cells on here, and like people would call it hair-like. Now, there is a feature on here that's real commonly seen in these optic nerve gliomas. What am I talking about here? There's one right there. Um, so there's these um, like uh, isonophilic material, uh -huh. pink ones. Uh -huh. um, and I think they're like degradation products. Are these uh, Rosenthal? Exactly. These are called Rosenthal fibers. And so these are characteristically seen in these low-grade astrocytomas. You get these little pink eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusions, and there's a close-up of one. And they call these Rosenthal fibers. So you've got this low-grade astrocytoma, Rosenthal fibers. Now, the one thing I want you to remember is if you have a particular tumor that's out of the normal age group in the optic nerve, those can be more aggressive. So you have a glioma in a kid, that's usually a grade one, non-aggressive. If you get a glioma in an older adult, which is really uncommon, those can be aggressive. And so you gotta remember, if you're outside that normal age range, then they behave differently. But in a kid with an optic nerve, astrocytoma, glioma like this, these are usually low grade. Now, the problem is, what do you do? You cut the nerve out again, you kill the vision. You let it grow, what does it do? It kills the vision. You radiate these. Well, some people say, yeah, radiation really helps. Others say, yeah, that kills the nerve anyway, so you're pretty much stuck. Can I ask how often you see optic nerve biopsy specimens? Very rare. Very rare, because oftentimes <coughs> we go by the scans, and you'll see when we talk about these in Orbit Conference, Chris Davidson has really nice scans that can allow us to differentiate these. But we do, I've seen biopsies on occasion. They're very, very rare that you see them. The one problem is if you have what you think is a astrocytoma and you do superficial optic nerve biopsy and you just get the sheath itself, it, you can often get a little reaction to the meninges overlying it that almost looks like a, a meningioma. And so you've got to be really careful when you read those superficial optic nerve biopsies. You don't overcall it. This is what I mean by that. This is an optic nerve glioma here. And you can see it's growing inside the nerve squeezing that nerve down, but overlying it, you get this reactive meningeal <coughs> proliferation. I promise that wasn't a planned question. And so you can get this reactive meningeal change overlying it. So if someone does just a biopsy of that, you say, oh my God, it's a meningioma. That shouldn't happen in a 10-year-old. And so you can get this reactive meningeal proliferation, but underlying it, here's that pilocytic astrocytoma under here with this reactive proliferation of the meninges overlying. So you gotta be really careful when you do a biopsy that you get parenchyma of the nerve itself. Here you can see again, this is a glioma with, with proliferation of the meningothelial cells. Chris, what are we seeing here? 
looks like a proptonic right eye with subconscious dermal hemorrhage, prominent figure of that. All right, so you'd worry about, again, something behind that eye pushing it back. Now, the other thing you can say is you can say that, that this is probably a little Greek or Italian lady because they've got the mustache. So <laughs> you're, you are allowed to make fun of your own kind. So I'm Greek, I'm not out of here. So I thought it was normal when your grandma would kiss you when you were a kid, you'd get that little tickle from the mustache. You know? so, so she could also be Greek. All right, so what are we seeing here, Chris? But what more specifically? I'm showing one feature here. Uh, the, art, the, the vessel looks a little funny, prominent, coming back out. Exactly. Of what do we call that? This ciliol retinal artery? It, it's a shunt. Yeah. It's a shunt yeah. artery. And so if you think about it, if something squeezes the optic nerve slowly, slowly growing lesion squeezes it and starts getting ischemic, you can get these shunt vessels almost like you get in a central retinal vein occlusion where you can get some shunt vessels at the optic nerve. And so this is a shunt vessel of the optic nerve. So that's a sign that something behind there is squeezing it. And then you look at the scan here on this MRI scan. What is this showing? It's like a fusiform lesion on the right optic nerve, you know, running parallel with the nerve. Yeah, so I wouldn't call this fusiform because it's not in the nerve, you know, tapering and then growing and tapering. It looks like there's something around the nerve. And so radiologists, they don't sniff formalin, but they sit in the dark too, and so they're pretty good at hallucinating. And so this is the so-called tram track sign. And so what it means is there's a nerve in the center, and then there's like some thickened tissue around it. And so they call this the tram track sign. And this is, of course, the ultimate example of that, a huge tumor that is pinching on the optic nerve in the center. And so what kind of tumor is this? Meningioma. Meningioma, exactly. So I showed you those pictures of those reactive meninges, but this is truly a tumor of those meningothelial cells. And so when you look at them, they almost look like squamous cells. They have this pink cytoplasm. You see the nucleus with chromatin and nucleoli there. And this is what they look like. So if you looked at that, they almost look like squamous cells. And again, like squamous cells, they often form worlds. But in these meningothelial cells, when they start to grow, you will get these concentric concretions of calcium and hyaline. What do we call those? Somoma bodies. And how's that spelled? P-S-A-M-N-O-A. Yeah, so there's a double M in there, so, so, but it's a P-S. Somoma. And so somoma bodies. And these are these concentric calcified um, concretions that are in there. And they almost look like the little squamous whorls that you get in a squamous cell carcinoma. So they all they look kind of similar when you look at them. And they also originate from the arachnoid layer? They originate from the arachnoid subarachnoid space. Now sometimes they can come from meninges elsewhere. So we just talked about an overcome, the sphenoid wing. And yeah, they can come from the sphenoid wing and come out. They can come from the meningothelial cells there and go back. And so they can start from any one of those different areas. Kind of like a um, astrocytoma, these aren't really malignant cells that metastasize. But again, if you're squeezing the optic nerve, you can cause a lot of damage to it. And it's tough to go in there and try to peel these guys off. Because once you do, you kill the blood supply to the nerve. So again, you save the nerve, you kill it. And so these are tough to treat also. All right, now this is a, a kind of a re-put together sagittal scan here. Um, Reese. There's um, a big uh, all right, so another intraconal mass. And so we've talked about stuff that can come from that intraconal area around the optic nerve. We have gliomas, we have meningiomas. What else can, can grow there? Uh, Mets. Mets, but what else? Um, so what other, what other cells can be in there? So we said meningiomas, uh -huh. said gliomas. Actually, and there's one other one that may not be coming from the nerve itself, but from the little nerves kind of adjacent to it, schwannomas. So you can even get schwannomas in the intracornal space. Not common, but you can get them in there. And now, what is the classification that we do for schwannomas, the pathologic classification? 
Exactly. So for, for once, there's a, a pathologist who like wasn't an Austrian. Um, Antonio was Italian, so I can't believe there's actually an Italian pathologist who named something. So, and Antoni named the cell type, and there's Antoni A and Antoni B, characters proliferation for the schwannomas. So which one is this one? A. This is Antoni A, so it looks fascicular. So it kind of looks like, you know, you ever see flocks of birds, how they kind of sweep together? And so that's what this looks like. It looks like a big flock of birds sweeping together. So this is the Antoni A. And then the Antoni B has a more mixoid look. It's got this kind of fluid and hyaluronic acid and all that around it. And so I don't think there's a difference prognostically. And these are very rare, but you can get schwannomas within the cone that can affect the optic nerves. Okay, so we say goodbye to the grand ketones and... Sure. Sure. So yes. that's coming from the adjacent nerves, not the actual optic nerve? Exactly. Usually it doesn't come from the optic nerve itself. There's little nerves that kind of run around it too. But it can come from the optic nerve, but not commonly. Okay. Yeah. So the, the grand teton, the middle one, has had glaciers on here for, you know, um, since the last ice age receded. And over the last 20 years, those glaciers have receded so much because of, you know, uh, global warming which is, is a plot from the Chinese to, you know, hobble our industries. But for some reason, that, that plot, that, that false thing has caused all the glaciers to melt. So sadly, just in the years since I used to go up there and hike all the time, the glaciers are just melting away. And in another couple decades of record heat, you're not going to have any glaciers that are up on the ground anymore. It'll just be bare rock in, in August. All right, so with that political aside that I had to sneak in there, Next week will be orbit, so know your orbit, because there's lots of stuff in the orbit that we can talk about. So, orbit. All right, thanks. Thank you.